So here I am in the shop, and today we're gonna to do part two of the Muncie tapes. In this part, we're gonna deal with the detailing of the gears and some sub-assemblies of some synchronizer rings, and basically how I kind of fit everything together. It looks like it's gonna be going on about a three or four part series so far. Things are moving along quite nicely. Uh, I really like the way things were coming out, to my surprise. And, uh, and I wanna thank all you guys for subscribing and watching the video in the first part it means a lot to me and if you can and you haven't already please subscribe to my youtube channel and hit the notification link share my videos and so forth so let's get to it see how this one works out thanks so what i'm doing again here is i'm going to be upgrading this early seven agents counter shaft case to a one inch counter shaft so the case was bored to fit my extended fit counter shaft to one, to, it's basically the one inch shaft, which is a little bit undersized than one inch, but they call it a one inch shaft. And then I'm going to retrofit the newer style M20 Italian gear sets in them. I really like these gear sets for several reasons. They are pretty true to the original prints as far as the engagement teeth go, and they eliminate the spacer tube inside the cluster gear. So it's a solid piece inside here, so it really makes the cluster easier to load. So I really like these gear sets. All right, so let's look at this gear set. This is one of the Italian gear sets again. What I really like about these Italian sets is a few things. First is the engagement teeth on the gears are correct. They're not back cut for torque locking. So you can use standard sliders on them. It's very important to me. The gears themselves are very good quality. They look good. Usually they don't come in with any dings or dents in them, but it's your job as a builder to inspect any new gear that comes in for dents, dings, or whatever, and address those issues. What I can tell you what I don't like about these gears is the fact that they don't have oil relief grooves on the thrust surfaces of second and third speed gear. They do it on first gear. You can see these oil relief grooves over here. And these are very important because it allows the oil to circulate around the gear and expel itself and not overheat. They don't do it on third as well. GM never did this, but this is a trick that I do on my boxes. I always will grind notches on these gears to circulate oil better. So what I'm gonna do is inspect again all the gears, make sure that there's no dings or dents in them. And sometimes I might just pass, if the edges look a little bit rough, I'll pass my, my kind of like, you know, Dremel type Fordham tool on the, on the gears and clean up the edges. The counter gears usually are in pretty good shape. These new counter gears, the front ends look like they're ground gearing. You can see the shininess to that, as opposed to hob gearing over here. What's also cool about them is the inside of the gear. It's got a built-in spacer tube. There's no, you no longer have that seam tube in there, which makes it a lot easier for you to load the needles in there. So that's a really cool plus. It's beefier design. It's got a little bit more of a, a taper here, if you notice, and more radius in it. it. Seems to be like a stronger piece, and also again beautifully machined. I've actually built many transmissions with these gears and I haven't had one break yet. So what I'm going to do is going to detail this whole gear set. But before I do that, I wanted to give you some pointers on things that you may want to look out for when inspecting the gear set before you put it together. Some things are going to be very obvious and some things not so obvious. So let me show you what I'm talking about. The engagement teeth of the gear. These engagement teeth on this gear are fairly worn. You can see how they're all chopped up. They've lost their point definition. And so when they lose their point definition like this, what's going to happen is, is that it's going to tend to cause the slider to wear. So the matching part, the slider that has pointy teeth that go against this, they're going to get banged up. So you can see that these teeth are flattened out. They're not in good shape. Some are chipped up pretty bad. This is also what holds the transmission in gear. So if these teeth are worn and pushed back like this, the transmission is not gonna be able to stay in gear. These are pretty well hammered. So that's an obvious thing, obviously you can see that. It's not a problem. You wanna check sometimes for any type of galling on the surfaces where the gear might have been running hot. This doesn't look bad, but sometimes you'll start seeing that the metal's been displaced from the flanges or inside here. So you wanna make sure that everything looks nice and smooth. And this is pretty obvious see here. Obviously, this gear has been broken. Nice uh, hard one-two shift at a drag strip. Peel the teeth off of this gear. So that's very obviously, and you're going to have to change that in the matching gear. So when you first look at these gears, they may 
look okay. This is a racing gear set from an old T5 transmission that I used to build. And but look at the pitting here on the teeth. You see that? Now, all gears aren't through hardened. They usually only have a case hardening, and usually the case hardening depth is around 30 thousandths deep. That's usually the average for gears. So what's happening here is the hardness is starting to flake off and spall off the gear. And this could be wrong type of lubricant, too tight backlash, something happened here with this gear. And you could see here, it's typically usually a heat treating issue that causes this. All right. So when you have gears like this, they'll actually work. They'll probably be a little bit noisy, but eventually they'll come apart on you. Now here I got this counter gear. And if you want to look at this counter gear, it's hard to see, but it's been banged up here. If you see little indications like this where it took a shot, could have been in shipping, something hit, hit this gear here. And you could feel a rough spot when you run your finger over this. Now this is very subtle. A lot of people don't pick this up. And usually you can see another little ding over here, all right? So what happens is when you put a transmission together with gears like this, they'll probably work fine but you may hear a little bit of a ticking or a knocking noise. And what you kind of have to do is go over with the dress up tool and kind of just come across this thing and smooth it all out and then really eye it up in the light and make sure you can't see or raise the edge anywhere. It's permissible to kind of cut these down because the tooth is really contacting the center portion or the root of the tooth, which is fine. So usually it's okay and permissible to clean these up. But sometimes I've gotten them where they're so badly banged up they're not usable. But you can see here, took a shot, this is usually due to poor handling, poor packaging, a lot of poor material handling happens all the time. It's quite common and very hard to deal with a lot of times. So when I sell gears, I have to inspect every gear. I don't leave them in the original boxes and I check them out. This looks pretty good, but you see you got a little bit of a ding here, a little bit of dent here. Poor quality, again, in terms of the way these gears were handled. And this probably happened right from the factory and they were probably banging against each other on a cart or something like that. Another point often overlooked is scuffing. Now this gear isn't too bad here, but in the, you can hardly see, but there's a distinct wear mark through the center of the tooth, right down over here. Now what happens in this case is that it might have been run low on oil and the gears start to gouge each other. Normally the tooth profile is shaped like this on the root, then it starts to kind of go like this. So it starts to gouge out the center of the tooth. And what happens is you're going to end up with gear noise. And a lot of people will tell me, hey, I got this whining noise in the transmission. And it's all because usually the main drive section had run low on oil and the teeth started to get gouged out in the center. And it's evident when they scuff. Now, even though this gear looks good, this was taken out of a transmission that had a lot of noise, that had a lot of whining noise. And it was the simple little wear pattern over here that I picked up that a lot of builders couldn't see. Very crucial. And sometimes they're, they're just slight like this gear, and sometimes they're really bad. So you want to check the center of your gear teeth and make sure they're nice and clean and smooth and that nothing is scuffed up over here or blue looking, or it looks like that somebody went over with very rough sandpaper. So this gear is no good. It's made a good pilot tool maybe, but anyway, I, I saved it just to show people what that looks like. It's very subtle, but it makes a big difference when it comes to building a unit. So with this particular Muncie build, I'm going to be using some new gears. And the biggest problem with a lot of these new gears is that they overdo it on the uh, phosphate coatings of the gears. There's too much coating on the gears and it gives it a very rough and very drag-like type of finish to the gear. It doesn't allow the gear to kind of really spin smooth on the shaft. So you can get different bore polishes. And I actually do this even on the, the used gear sets, but I don't really do much with used gear sets now. So what I'm going to do is just spray some WD-40 as a lubricant on this polishing tool. Then I'll put it in here and I'll go through the bore and just clean it up. But I want to take that coating right off so it spins nice and smooth on the main shaft. This adds a lot to it, believe it or not. It makes a big difference. So I kind of do it like this just to get a cross hash pattern similar to like honing a cylinder bore in an engine. Now going from the other side. You're really not taking off that much material, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. I do this on every build. This is how I build them. So I'm doing second now. Same thing. Cleaning it up. 
I'll do it until I see none of the black stuff left in there. So I'm just removing the black oxide coating. I use a 120 grit bore polisher. All right, so that's the, the, the type of grit that I use. And it comes out really nice and smooth, looks great. All right, and I'll do that to the third gear as well. So that's third gear. So if you notice that first B gear, I mentioned earlier, it has oil slots in it. And notice that these oil slots on the thrust surface are not on center, they're slightly off center. And being off center helps actually create a pumping action and a rotation of the oil. So what I'm gonna do now is I have a Fordham tool and I'm gonna do the same thing with this tool. I got a small little cutoff wheel on it. I'm gonna go in and just put some notches on these gears, all right? Slightly off center. And as I mentioned, none of these new gears come like this. I don't know why. I think it's very important. And my main shafts actually have oil reliefs in them as well to help promote better oiling. I've seen too many gears seize up right along these edges over here. Same thing for third. They got this big flange here, but again, no oil relief. Very dumb. If you look at any gearbox in any manufacturer from the OEM, they will always have oil slots on the back of the gears. And it seems to be that GM didn't do this on certain gears, and it might have been a mistake, who knows, but the people reproducing the gears, because they don't really think that much for themselves, they just copy the same thing which is really a problem. So you can see what I did there, right? It's no big deal. You just want to have a way for the oil to kind of come through the gear. In other words, it's going to come through here and it may go through and then it may come out. It's got to exhaust someplace. And if you don't have a place for it to exhaust, it's going to be a problem. It's not going to work. So that's how that works. This is a Super T10 third speed gear. Look what they did. They've even put oil reliefs on the cone side of the gear, as well as four reliefs on the thrust surface of the gear on the back side. Okay. That's a smart thing to do. It's amazing that people aren't thinking about this and doing this on all gear sets. So, when you're doing a transmission and you want to prep it properly, you can put your, and it doesn't have oil reliefs on both sides, you want to put them there, at least put two on there. Doing four like this is a different way approach of doing it, but it's not necessary. So what I'll do now on these, you see this is a little bit different arrangement. There's not really any thrust surface on second gear to do that. It thrusts in here and that's okay. There's enough oil in here. On the third speed gear, we'll do the same thing. We're going to put some notches in the cone area over here because this is going to go thrust right against the hub and we don't want it locking up on the hub for any reason at all. Just like the gears, the cone surface is very important as well. You might find some cones that get banged up or dinged up. So you might have to take that and, and take a file maybe to them or take actually an abrasive stone and kind of clean up the cones if you feel that they're rough or there's a high spot on them or there's a nick in them. So all the prep work makes a big difference. So checking the gears, inspecting them. What I'm going to also do is just again inspect and eye all the edges of these teeth on all the gears. Make sure that, again, there's no dings or no high spots on the corners I'll look. And then if I feel that, you know, this thing might look a little rough, there might be some areas that may need cleaning up, I'm going to take my flexible shaft from Fordham and I'm going to go in there and I'm going to just kiss these edges with this abrasive wheel, just like this, and go down in this fashion on everything like this. Then I might go in like this on this edge here like that and go up that way 
see, in that fashion, just go through all the teeth and dress them all up like this. All right, that's the motion, and that's how I'll do it. So, and I'll do it on all the sides. If I can, some it's hard to get in there, I'll do the same thing here. And I'll be careful not to hit the back side of the tooth over here like this. So I'll kind of come in like this and just work each tooth. So every gear, I'll usually go through that and clean that all up, especially on used sets. All right, so it'll be something like this. I'll go in, I'll just go like this. Then I'll hit these sides like this. Okay? Back side, same thing. You get the idea. So that's basically how I prep the gears before I start putting the transmission together. A few things. You might see people selling gears that are super finished. They're pre-done from the factory, all nice and shiny. And that's really good and it looks pretty, but I really don't do that. I only do that on my high-end race units, but the gears will be shot peened first and then they'll be polished. And they won't be polished with a bunch of gears at once thrown in a, in a tumbler. Basically what super finishing does is it puts into a vibratory refinishing thing with these stones. The problem is these people are just throwing gears in these things and they're all banging against one another in this and you end up putting more dings on the cones of the gears and actually creating more damage than good. The other problem with super finishing is, is that, again, although it looks trick and it sounds good and everybody's really impressed with it, the problem is you can have a gear laying inside the vibratory feeder and working and working and working on the synchro cones and what you end up doing is getting irregular shaped cones. You get low spots and high spots on the cones of the gears. You really have to be set up properly and there's very few people in this country that know how to do it correctly. So. When I do the gears, they get actually sent out to a house that does NASCAR work and they also do pro drag work. So that's the only two companies I use. I don't use anybody else. I don't buy gears against super finished. The other thing is most of these people selling super finished gears out of the box, they don't take the time to deburr the gears. So you got this gear set that looks really good, but it's got dings and dents all over it and it's just shiny. And a lot of people think, oh, it's already done. I'll just throw it in the gearbox and then they hear noises and knocking noises and stuff like that. So always have a good eye when you're looking at the gears before you do the installation. Before, and you know, that's very important. So that's all I have to say about finishing gears. Let's get to putting this gear set together and prepping the other parts. So the next step is to prep the gears for synchronizer rings. What I usually do is whether they are new or used gears, I'll take some 800 paper, wet dry paper, Go around the cones and just scuff them up. It's kind of like breaking the glaze of the cone because some rings will be skidding across cones for a long time. So even though this is a new gear, this is the procedure. I just kind of take some 800 paper again, break the glaze, right? Now, what I do is you want to check synchronizer rings. There's the obvious thing here that you can do is you can put the ring on the gear and see if it wobbles. And you can see that this ring here is a bad ring. I'm putting it down here and it's actually wobbling. It's not really going to sit on the cone correctly. Sometimes you might get a ring that, let's just say, maybe has a slight wobble to it, but you might think it's going to seat. It's not as bad, all right? Then, of course, you're going to have a ring that fits really good. This is a problem with rings today, no matter where you get them. You just have to sort through rings. So when I sell rebuild kits, I actually do this prior to putting the rings in the kit. I don't just throw rings in the kit. I actually check them first. But what I want to do is show you a trick that I do. I'll take a marker, like a Sharpie, and I'll mark the gear like this, maybe every 90 degrees, let's say, right? I'm going to drive for a second there. Now I'll show you what happens here. If I put this ring on it that wobbled really bad, this one here, and I go on here and I move it back and forth, you're going to see that it hardly made contact with the cone of the gear. Over here a little bit. Over here a little bit. Maybe over here fully. It's not right. Let's clean this up again. Let's 
mark it again. And this is what I do, all right? This is all part of setting up the transmission. It's not just a question of slapping parts together. Now let's take a good ring. I think this is a good ring here. And put it on here. Fits tight. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm putting a downward pressure to feel that the ring actually locks on the gear. In other words, I'm pushing this way and then with this hand pushing that way to squash it together. Now you can see that, look at the contact pattern we have there. It's fully across everything. You can see the distinct oil groove lines of the ring on the whole gear. So you can see that this ring is sitting nicely on the gear in all corners all the way around. Every 90 degrees it fits well and it's going to work well then. These two rings, they're scrap. So again, once you, you got your ring sorted out on your gears, you do each gear. Put the ring on that, ring is going to stay on it. And if you want, you could take your sharp and you could measure that this is like the fourth gear ring. This is going to be, let's say, third and so forth, all right? This way you know where they are. Same thing, if you look at this gear itself too, I think you'll see you got a nice pattern on that gear as well. Hope you could see that. So that's how I set the rings up. So what I'll start doing is I'll put the input shaft bearing on first. Some bearings may slide on, some bearings may need to be tapped down. You can heat the bearing up and slide it in place, you could press it in place, whatever works for you. There's no real way of doing it other than you just don't want to beat the hell out of the bearing. If you're going to try to do it with a punch, make sure you gently punch down on the inner race, not on the outer race. Always press on whatever race is taking the press fit. So on this case, you would support it on the inner ring here and press down that way. Or, you know, you could use, again, a punch or a, a collar, a tuba, a piece of pipe or something and go right down on it that way. All right. First things first. Everybody always asks me about oil slingers. They go on this way with the protruding inner edge facing towards the front, not backwards. They do not go the other way around like this, all right? They go like this. Very important. It's very important to have the slinger on. It acts as an oil shield, keeps dirt out, and helps things make the bearing live longer. So sometimes the bearing will maybe go down, it's not. Now, if you're going to use a punch, use a punch with a fat end on it, what I do is, you don't want to obviously slip off and do this, or hit it here, or here. You want to stay on the inner ring. I kind of put my hand here like this, I'm holding it, and I'll just gradually tap it down. Now, if it's a real heavy press fit, like on a Super T10, I use a press. Something like this, I'm pretty confident I can get it down all the way without making a mess of things. So that's how I do it. You can use a, a, a tube or a pipe, that works just as well. You can see how I'm doing it. I'm kind of always holding this and gradually doing it. If you don't feel comfortable doing this, don't. I've been doing this for years, so I'm not going to ruin a bearing. Now, the reason why I put the bearing on is because I don't want to be putting the bearing on after I put the needle bearings on the inside over here which is our next step is to do needles. I use the case, just lay it on there like that, all right? And I've got the main drive needles already set up in the cage with a rubber band holding it in place. Now, I have a video on how I do this, so you can watch the video. There'll be links to all these videos on my channel. I'm spraying some lube on the, the needles because I want them to slide out of the rubber band fairly easy. So I'm going to just put it in here like this and then just push it through. And what will happen is if I, I can take the, the band out, it'll come right out. See? There you go. Now what you want to do to keep it in place is take some assembly lube and put them inside here just to hold it in place. Now you can also individually put these needles in with grease in the cage if you have to do that if you're going to reuse your your own cage your old cage 
But again, I have a video that shows you how I do this. There you go. All right, so I've got my needle bearings packed in the counter gear. I don't know if you could see that there. It's a nice pack there all the way through, as well as in the main drive section. Links, again, are below in the description on the videos that pertain to these two subjects with loading needles and doing the needles in the input shaft as well. So there's no need to repeat that here. But what I always do is in any of my builds, and the reason why I don't use dummy shafts, and I said that before because dummy shafts to me are for dummies, is you want to be able to make sure everything feels good. Sometimes you can get shafts that have little nicks and things in them, and you won't know that until you put the whole unit together. So what I do is I'll put the whole shaft in the gear just like this and spin it, check it out, make sure it feels really good. This is nice and smooth. So I know that when this is in the unit, it's going to be nice and smooth. There's not going to be any problems. And also, it does help pack the needles. i got my finger here. I'm holding the spaces so they don't come out. That's done. I'll do the same thing with the input shaft to the output shaft. I want to check to see how it feels. Put it on like that. I could feel a little bit of a... There's some noise going on that I don't like. If I look at this and inspect it, it has these distinct wear marks on the main shaft. This could have been from it getting banged around at one time, or sometimes, believe it or not, when the unit is in fourth gear and there's some issue going on with wheel hop because the needles aren't turning when it's in fourth gear, you'll get these distinct marks on the output shaft. So when everything's locked together in fourth gear, a lot of times, again, if you have wheel hop or something severe goes on with the car, you can get these indentations in the, the main shaft. So this is no good. Now, what I do is I have my main shafts that are two pounds lighter because they're rifle drilled in the inside, and they have oil relief grooves already in them over here. These are explained in another video I have on the channel. If I were to reuse the old main shaft, I would put these notches in there. I would grind little notches in it for oiling. You want to do notches like this, one side and 180 degrees on the other side. So we're going to be using a new main shaft. If I put that on here, nice and smooth. So again, these are important little checks before you're actually putting the unit together. It's a good way to just double check everything. Push the needles down, make sure they stay in place. Now we're ready to start do some sub-assembling. All right, as far as the case goes, it's a 385-1325 case, which was primarily used in GM vehicles in 64 to 1965 model years. It's a replacement case. It's not an original case because it has a CC9 number on it, which means counter case 9, which means that it was a replacement case probably issued in the year of 1969. These cases uh, come from the factory brand new, but with a wider pad on them. Now, the case was bored out to fit the later one inch counter shaft, and we're gonna be using again that extended fit counter shaft with the threaded section for the billet mid plate. It also had the lower boss actually drilled and tapped for a drain plug, which is very important. So, got some new plugs on it for fill and drain, and also the ears of the case have been spot faced and cleaned up, so we get a nice clamping surface. So it's very good. All the threads have been chased, a few helicoils put in it. Overall, it looks really good. So when it comes to putting the input shaft and the counter gear in the main case, which we're going to do now, I just wanted to go over one point. Some people will put the front bearing on afterwards. In other words, they'll put the input shaft on the whole gear train, slide the gear train into the case, then put the front bearing in from the front like this. That's okay to do that, but the problem is, is that you might end up having a problem where the synchronizer ring, if it's on there and you're tapping in that front bearing, you could jam the ring up against the synchronizer assembly. So I prefer not to do that. Some applications, however, like with some Super T10s in certain ratios, you cannot get the input shaft in the case with the front bearing in place. All right. But what I do is I will chamfer the inside edge 
over here if it's not already done, clean it up, and I'll make sure I'll test fit everything. I'll put this in like this and just test fit that I can get this in with no problem. They're usually not that, that hard to get in, but you got to kind of make sure that it goes in like this. See? Then I know it's going to be fine. Don't forget my needles are already inside of here still. They're being held in with assembly lube. Now we can start putting this thing together. So that about wraps up part two. Hope you liked it. Please subscribe to the channel. Stay tuned for part three. Thanks. What? <laughs>